Sometime around 1988, I really wanted a Nikon F301, also known as the Nikon N2000. But a lack of funds and a bit of rational thinking made me look at more affordable options, and I eventually settled on the very well-specified Ricoh XRX, which I carried on using as my main camera until I swapped to Nikon DSLRs in the early noughties. I didn't really think about the old film Nikons again until recently, when I thought that it would be nice to use some of my collection of Nikon fit lenses on a film body. I quite fancied a Nikon FM or FE, but tested and working examples were a bit expensive, and on this occasion I didn't really want to have to strip the camera down before I could even use it. Then while looking for something completely different, I found that I could get a fully tested Nikon F501 for a fairly affordable price. The F501, also known as the N2020, was more or less identical to the F301, but it also had autofocus. I kept that idea in mind, and then when a family member asked me what I'd like for Christmas, I said I wouldn't mind a Nikon film camera. So we agreed that I would buy the camera, check that it was working correctly, and then hand it over to them to wrap up ready for the big day. Well, you know how it is with the best laid plans and all that. I ordered a fully tested and working Nikon F501 from a proper camera shop. It arrived and the autofocus didn't work, not even a tiny little bit. I tried multiple lenses and different batteries and moving the AF selector switch multiple times in case there was a bad contact, but still nothing. Even the AF assist that normally works with non-AF lenses didn't work, so that camera was returned to the shop to be exchanged for another copy of the same camera that was slightly tattier but had working autofocus. In reality, I probably won't use the autofocus that much, but there might be some times I want to use it, and fully tested and working should mean that everything works as it should. So, along comes the second copy of the camera. I got it out of the box, and it didn't work at all. This time, I think it was due to the battery contacts being corroded from a previous battery leak. They probably had been making contact before it was jostled around in the post, and once I'd cleaned those properly, the camera came to life. Great, you'd think, but we're still keeping up my record that 100% of the cameras I've bought as tested and working haven't been working, or at least not fully working anyway. Because although on a casual glance the autofocus was working, the system wasn't working correctly. In single autofocus mode, the camera should hunt for a focus lock, and once locked on, the green LED in the viewfinder illuminates, and you can take your shot. If the autofocus can't lock onto the subject, you can't take a shot. In continuous autofocus mode, the autofocus is active the entire time you keep the shutter button half pressed, and you can take a shot at any time, regardless of whether it's managed to get a focus lock or not. In manual focus mode, you'll still get the green light in the viewfinder to confirm that you focus correctly, but you can press the shutter at any time, or at least that's how it should work. On the copy I received, single autofocus worked as it should do, but in both manual and continuous mode you could only take the shot when the green focus light was illuminated, so there was obviously an electrical gremlin lurking in the camera. I continued fiddling with the camera for a bit, and after working the AF selector switch backwards and forwards many times, the AF system started operating as it should do. The selector switch not only moves the physical autofocus drive shaft into position, but it will also have a set of electrical contacts behind the cover, and I suspect one of these was dirty and not making a connection until I'd moved it enough times. I re-glued the trim which had obviously been taken off, or had fallen off, and been very badly glued back in position, and gave the camera to the family member for them to give back to me on Christmas Day. I'm sure you can guess where this is going. I opened my present on Christmas morning, all excited to have a new 80s icon camera to play with, and it didn't work. This time it seemed to be having an entire system failure. When you half pressed the shutter, the lights in the viewfinder would flash randomly, and the aperture stop-down leaf would twitch all the time. 
Obviously, I checked the batteries and the battery contacts and moved all the switches over and over again to see if I could clean any bad contacts, but it just wouldn't work. So I put it back in the box and carried on doing all the other sorts of things you'd expect to be doing on Christmas Day. I periodically tried the camera again over the next few days until suddenly it started working properly and it hasn't failed again since. My thoughts on this are, possibly there was a bad contact somewhere in the camera which was providing a very dirty power to the main CPU, or possibly the DC to DC converter inside the camera which should provide a stable 5.5 volt supply to the CPU was playing up. Anyway, for now it's working so I'll leave it alone in the hopes that it carries on working. In the period since then I've got another couple of non-working bodies, which, if nothing else, I can use as a practice run if I ever have to take apart my working copy. One of those bodies was an F301, which had badly corroded battery contacts, and once those were sorted, it works. Although not perfectly, because the aperture stop-down lever is sluggish. I think there's some sort of retardation device somewhere over this side of the camera, which you can hear sounding dry and squeaky. The non-working F501 has had a major battery leakage, and the corrosion has even got into the mirror box area, but it still might be recoverable. I'll have to have a look at that sometime. I'll probably do that one first, as I've got nothing to lose if it's unsuccessful. Anyway, on to the main point of this video, which is to have a quick look round the F501. I've actually got a film in this one at the moment, so anything like opening the back or firing the shutter will have to be done on one of the other camera bodies. On the front of the camera we have the lens release button, the socket for the remote shutter release, which I don't have, and the AF selector switch for manual focus, continuous autofocus, and single autofocus. On the other side there's the self-timer lamp that blinks as the self-timer counts down, auto-exposure lock and auto-focus lock buttons that allow you to move the subject away from the centre of the viewfinder whilst holding the exposure or focus at that level. Below those is the self-timer release button, which is recessed to prevent you accidentally triggering it. A fingernail can be the best way of setting off the self-timer. This differs on the F301 where the auto exposure lock is this lever, with the button in the centre being the self timer release, which gives you something like a 10 second delay before the shutter fires, allowing you time to run back and join in the group shot you're photographing. Inside the lens mount on the F501 and not the 301, there are electrical contacts for the newer lenses and around the outside is the AI indexing lever, which gets moved by the aperture ring, telling the camera how many stops away from fully open the lens will be when it stops down. This allows for correct exposure readings without having to stop down the lens to take a reading. When you're using program mode with a suitable lens, the aperture ring is locked at the minimum aperture and the camera sets both the shutter speed and the aperture automatically. Moving round to the back of the camera, there's the little window to show you what type of film you have inside, and another window over here that spins as the film is advanced. This gives you a visual confirmation that the film is advancing correctly, particularly when you first load a roll, although watching the rewind crank has always done the trick for me. Opening the back of the camera involves the fairly standard pulling up of the rewind crank. In the film chamber we have the DX code reading pins. Handily the ISO on these cameras can be manually set because many of the funky modern films don't have DX coding on the canisters. I had to make a little sticker out of metal and insulation tape to put a roll of foamer pan in my Canon Sure Shot the other day. In the middle is the metal vertical focal plane shutter, and on the right the auto loading film take up drum. I'll show you loading a film later on. Below that are the electrical contacts for a data bag. The backs were very simple to swap. Just pull down this little spring-loaded pin and off comes the back, ready to install another one. There's the viewfinder in the centre and the rewind protect slider over to the right. On the top left is the rewind crank. 
I quite like the fact that it's a manual rewind. It means that you can still get the film out if the batteries die, and you can leave the tail exposed in case you want to take the film out part way through to swap it from black and white to colour or whatever, then reinsert it later and shoot with the lens cap on to get back to where you left off. Some cameras had this as an option even with a motor-driven rewind, but not all of them. Around that is the film speed dial, which you lift up to select between 3200 ISO and 12 ISO. Continuing beyond 12 ISO, you eventually get to the DX position that I'll probably never use. The same dial also has the exposure compensation, ranging from minus two stops to plus two stops. To move that, you hold down this pin, which allows you to turn the dial. Finally in that area is a red LED that will blink if you've inserted a non-DX coded film while the dial is in the DX position. It also lights up as the film winds on after the shutter is released. I've no idea why. You get a pretty good audible and tactile indication that the shutter has been fired, but maybe if you were using a remote cable it could be handy. In the middle is the hot shoe, with the main contact, ready light contact, TTL contact and monitor contact. On the right is the shutter release button, with a ring round which you lift and rotate to select the locked or off position, S for single shot mode and C to unleash the wallet busting burst rate of 2.5 frames per second. That may not seem fast, but let's say you had Portra 400 film in the camera and you were using a commercial lab to process and scan your photos, that's somewhere in the region of £2.70 per second, which would put it in the fairly expensive bracket as far as hobbies are concerned. Beneath that is the bleep on off switch. In my use, the bleeper will only sound if I'm using the self timer, but if you're using aperture priority or one of the program modes and the shot will either be over or underexposed, then the bleeper will sound when you half press the shutter as a warning. Next to that is the rewind button. To press this down, you first have to slide the slider to the right, then press the button, which latches down, allowing you to rewind the film. The button will pop back up as soon as it starts winding the next film. I forgot about this and pressed the button on the dead F501, so that'll have to stay down until I get a chance to look at that camera. That leaves us with the shutter speed dial, which gives us manual speeds from 1 second up to 1 2000th of a second, plus the usual bulb setting. If you move the dial into one of the auto modes, it will latch in position and you'll need to press this button to move it again. This is one area where the F301 is different. It has one less program mode than the F501, so I'll go through the ones on the F501. A is for aperture priority. You set the aperture manually using the aperture ring on the lens, and then the camera will select the appropriate shutter speed for the lighting conditions. This would be my favourite auto mode as I still retain some level of control. I'll skip dual for the moment. P or normal program mode selects a balanced aperture and shutter speed based on the lighting conditions, whereas P high or high speed program mode will opt for a bigger aperture and higher shutter speed, better for sport photography and so on. The dual mode will auto the dual mode will automatically select P or P high depending on the focal length of the lens that you have attached to the camera. This is only relevant with AIS lenses that tell the camera what their focal length is. Lenses with a focal length of 135mm and longer will trigger the high speed program mode. On the bottom of the camera is the battery compartment. My fully working camera has the optional version that takes four AA batteries. The bottom is slightly deeper, but of course you do get a slightly better battery life. The other two have the standard AAA battery compartment, which has an inner carrier that the batteries slot into. You install the batteries as indicated, then line up the two white dots and ease the back edge of the holder down into the recess. This design does mean that the tripod socket is over to the side. Not my favourite location for stability, but it'll do. 
looking through the viewfinder, and I'll start off with the F301, which only has the exposure indicators. When you half press the shutter button in manual mode, the speed you have set on the dial will show as a solid number, while the correct speed will be blinking. You then either change the aperture or the shutter speed until they match up. Sometimes there will be two numbers blinking, in which case you can choose whether you want to slightly under or overexpose based on that intermediate reading. If there just isn't enough light, the underexposure arrow will blink at the bottom of the display, and similarly if there's too much light, the overexposure arrow will blink at the top. If you're in one of the auto modes, the display will just indicate what speed or intermediate speed it's going to take the shot at. There's no indication of which aperture it's selecting. Additionally, the bleeper will sound to warn you of potential blur on slower shutter speeds. And while we're still looking through the F301, you'll see that it's got quite a nice viewfinder with a split screen in the middle and a micro prism outside that. Compare that to the F501, which just has a ground glass, with areas marked out for the focusing in the centre rectangle and the exposure in the circle round that. The focusing screen was interchangeable, but you may struggle to find different ones these days. We now have the addition of the focus indicators in the viewfinder. With the camera in single focus mode, I can press the shutter button halfway and the camera will rotate the focusing ring until it locks onto focus, at which time the green light will illuminate in the centre bottom. If I set the camera to manual focus, I can turn the focus ring by hand until the green light illuminates when I achieve focus, assuming I'm holding the shutter button halfway. During manual focusing, the right arrow indicates that you need to turn the focus ring to the right, or towards infinity, and the left arrow tells you you need to turn to the left, or towards the closer end of the focus scale. Obviously I can ignore all of that and just use the focusing screen to focus. If the camera can't achieve focus, for instance if there are no suitable points for it to lock onto, it will then display a red X at the bottom of the viewfinder. In this case you'll need to switch to manual focus mode, and I don't think the indicators are actually pulsing like that, it's something to do with the frame rate of my phone which is shooting this video clip. If the subject is closer than the minimum focusing distance of the lens, a red triangle will appear which means you'll need to take a step backwards to achieve focus. Loading a film is about as easy as it gets. Pull up the rewind crank to open the back. Pop the film canister into the film chamber. Push the rewind crank back down. Pull the leader of the film across to the red mark. Check that the film is sitting neatly between the film guides, and close the back. Set the film speed, assuming you're not relying on DX coded films. Turn the lock to the S or C position. Give a single press on the shutter button, and the camera will advance the film four times to get to frame one. This does of course mean that you miss out on those extra bonus shots that you can sometimes get by carefully loading a film on a fully manual camera. You can confirm that the film is loaded correctly by either watching the rewind crank or the round window in the back door of the camera. To rewind and remove the film, slide the rewind protection slider and press the rewind button. Flip out the rewind crank and wind the film back until you feel it release from the take-up drum. If you don't need the leader sticking out, you can carry on winding to be sure it's safely back in the canister. Open the film door and remove the canister. I've already finished one roll of Kodak Vision 3 500T film in the F501. I'll do a separate video showing how that film performed, but here are a few samples for the time being.
And that's about it. I'm really enjoying using the F501. Everything about it is pure 1980s, including the soundtrack. Although there's no stealth shooting with this camera. I'll hopefully do the video looking at the Kodak Vision 3 film in a week or three, depending on how busy I am. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when future videos are released. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.